Okay, so hello and welcome to Improving Your Attributes. Um, first up, we should give a quick mention to the sponsors of this lovely, lovely event. Obviously, as has been said before, uh, without sponsors, it wouldn't actually happen or it would be very hard to put on with the amount of uh, fun stuff that we've got going on. Uh, and I quite literally wouldn't be here without at least one of them. Um, not that I'm biased towards that or anything, there's very little mention of that in this presentation, so there we go. Um, a lot of them have had a great presence here, um, although it's slowly clearing down on the tables outside. So I'd recommend chatting to all of us. We're friendly, um, mostly here actually, now I think about it. Um, while, you can, while you're here, as this is probably gonna be the last time you see the slide. Um, I'd also like to say a huge thank you to the organizers of Summit for putting this all together and getting it all done both this week and in the months leading up to it. It's an amazing time, I think, and the amount of work they put in is staggering. So, um, just really quickly, who am I? I'm James Ruskin, uh, often JP Ruskin online in the more professional side uh, and places on the internet. Uh, I've previously been employed in ops uh, and DevOps and would say that I was previously a PowerShell enthusiast. Um, to paraphrase the words of Mitch Hedberg, happily I am still a PowerShell enthusiast uh, and I'm now working at Chocolatey Software as a solutions engineer, hopefully helping people write PowerShell, Ansible, and just about anything else they'll let me touch. Um, for what it's worth, I speak faster when I'm nervous, as you're probably noticing right now, and I'll apologize way too often, so I am sorry about that. <laughs> so, <laughs> what are we actually going to talk about? Um, we're going to start off, um, we're going to dive into a range of useful attributes um, that already exist and how they can be used right now in PowerShell. Um, we're going to look at argument completers, which I am enthusiastic about. Um, and yeah, ever since they've got away from dynamic parameters, they've been really cool. Um, we can talk about argument transformations and what you can use it for and why you might want to use it. Um, and finally, we're going to go into writing both uh, class-based attributes and C-sharp based attributes, just briefly, um, which can be used uh, in order to add this stuff to your existing modules, functions, scripts, etc. So to kick off then, what's an attribute? What is an attribute? Um, I've actually written the note, what the heck am I actually talking about, which I think I've already said. Um, in this case, um, one of many cases, it's just about, sorry, bless you. Um, I'm talking about parameter attributes. Um, so, you know, examples of this are up here. Um, it's just about anything that you, it's, it's an object that you apply to um, parameters, to uh, the param block, uh, and other stuff along those lines. Um, they can be added to these with or without arguments. So you'll probably be familiar with some of these um, looking like this. Uh, and with either named, oops, sorry, where you're defining them with the name, and then a selection of arguments, possibly, um, with either named arguments or positional arguments. Um, uh, with obviously, yeah, positions being quite easy to see, but a little bit harder to define. So, you know, you've got min, min range there and max range, uh, which, yeah, there we go. So, we can start off by talking about available attributes, as I said a second ago. There are lots. And uh, yeah, the temptation to generate a kind of Tom Lehrer style song in the, the way of the Elements song uh, was tempting, but uh, there are just loads, so let's not go with there. We've got a whole bunch, including kind of parameter, alias, credential, PS default value. I'm not actually gonna read all these out because we're gonna dive into them in a second. Um, but we are going to look at a few of them. But as you can see, there's a whole bunch. Um, but I kind of group them together mentally into a couple of different groups, um, which happily pretty much marries up with what Microsoft says in their docs. Um, so I'll pretty much be along with that. So what we're going to go into just for this is a kind of path through. Uh, we're going to look at the parameter attribute and some of the arguments you can provide to that. We're going to look at attributes that help you validate the past data uh, way before you might start performing expensive operations to use that data or argument. Um, and of course, short circuiting anything before you start doing that. Um, we're gonna look at attributes that help you figure out what the heck your scripts and functions can actually do uh, on the command line. Um, and argument completers, as I said a second ago, I'm very excited about. Um, and they can help users on the command line, again, kind of on the discoverability side of things, find out what you're looking to do, what you can pass in, and the like. And as promised, we're going to look at transformation. So, um, we're going to jump into demos. Do 
Does that look all right? Is there, is that readable at the back? Fantastic. So, um, we said we were gonna start off, we were gonna talk about the parameter attribute and the various things you can chuck in there. Um, so we've got an example here, a terribly named function. Um, that currently has a couple of parameters. And you know, so obviously we've got a lot of stuff. But a nice thing to go with when you're developing functions, scripts, et cetera, um, with parameters is to basically have good defaults, uh, in my opinion, and uh, to, um, where, where you don't have good defaults, have good names so that you can actually get stuff um, working there. Thank you. Um, so, sorry, uh, mandatory parameters are obviously uh, parameters that you have to pass in. Um, this can be useful when you're trying to force users to actually pass all the data in. They're actually known as static properties when you've got them in your function, which is neat. Um, we've got stuff like parameter set names. So again, you know, you're looking at the good defaults style of things. You can say that you want a series of parameters to be available only in groups that work together. Um, we really don't want to do this one, aren't we? Uh, positional parameters, similarly, um, when you're passing in parameters, you can basically tell it that you, as earlier with the arguments, you can have params that uh, either you address by name or you can have them in the right place. And we're gonna dive into value pipeline stuff in a second. Um, the temptation was here, of course, as I've noted in this comment, uh, to basically put on every parameter possible. But happily, I haven't. Moving on to some validation attributes. We're at actual demos. Um, we are going to have a look through a couple of the things that we had up on the slides a second ago. Um, so we've got stuff like, you know, if, if you're looking at things to help validate information that you're passing in, um, there's kind of a couple of different separate subgroups that you've got there, such as, uh, you know, things to validate on set strings uh, and um, any kind of integer properties. Um, so you've got, uh, here we've got an example of validate set, which is kind of a very easy way of looking at whether a value is uh, something that you want to accept. Um, in this case, I've chosen terrible, terrible examples, but we can see that you know if, if you have a validate set that contains a couple of different things, you should be able to have uh, to check whether or not you can use those. Um, whereas you know if you tried something else that wasn't available. Uh, such as, yeah, I've used juice there, um, then we're gonna get an error that actually comes out and says that that's no good. Uh, happily, it also actually yeah, um, adds a little bit of tab completion, which again is great for discoverability. We'll come back to that in a second. Uh, it's not terribly dynamic, um, it's a little old, although there's some stuff that we're gonna come to in a second that will sort of allow you to do more stuff there. Um, we've uh, got an example of me throwing a huge error there, because you can't actually use stuff like variables or any dynamic stuff when you're doing that. So we can see that if we try that, then it's gonna fail out. Um, covered earlier today, perhaps, uh, was the dynamic validate set classes uh, that you can use to do slightly more complex stuff, again, in the, the kind of C-sharp model of things. Um, but I think that was covered earlier, so we're not going to do it here. Similarly, um, we've got stuff like validate range uh, and other numerical stuff uh, where we can basically say, hey, this should be between a couple of values. Um, we can go through and say, yeah, these, these are gonna work um, because we've got kind of anything between one and 10. Again, we, we came into that earlier when we said min and max range. Um, but there's also stuff like being able to say uh, a couple of different things. There's an enum called validate range kind uh, which allows for a couple of new things, um, such as positive, negative, non-positive, and non-negative. So you can update your function with one of those instead of the uh, min and max range. Uh, and it's far more supportive of psconf use bar tab. PSConf EU, I'm sorry, I'm in the wrong place here. Um, but we can see that you know when, when we've done that, instead of our min and max range of 10, um, we, we can go through and we only fail, you know, going to positive, obviously we've got our 11, which now succeeds. So it's, it's a little bit more, um, it, it's easy to do a couple of nice operations without going into the fun of validate script, for example, which is 
we're going to come to it in a second. Um, so similarly, we've got validate length, which basically you can go through and say, hey, we've got uh, a couple of lovely things like a username. Um, so you know, one of the problems I often have is I'll have uh, my, my traditional username in various places only five characters long. It's not actually James. That's a fairly boring username. But, but often I'll find that I'll fail because most places have kind of a six character minimum for whatever reason. It's, it makes sense. Um, but yeah, so we've got stuff like that. Uh, we can go down and look at arrays, uh, which again, we can validate that they have a certain number of um, values in. Um, so, you know, if we validate count on this thing, then we can say, hey, this uh, should have three in this case um, things. So we can grab our drink order of three things. But if we try a mere two, it's going to fail out. Uh, again, you know, this, this can help users get stuff right, um, and we'll come to disco uh, discoverability in a second. But so you can you can also have ranges that vary, which is neat. Um, into the more complex stuff, uh, and of course, without any regrets at all, I'm going to say that this one is going to be fun. Um, we we can use regex to do basically all the same things because regex is horribly powerful, um, and say, you know, in this case, we're going to try something that should only contain letters. Um, and we can go there and then, you know, if we have something that doesn't, it'll fail out uh, and tell you the pattern that's not matching. Again, not the best um, stuff in terms of error message, but uh, it, it's functional and it'll tell users what's going on. You can obviously then use regex to do similar stuff and have that um, validate length um, for if you wanted to, um, but that wouldn't be the nicest use of it. And we'll fail. Never mind. Um, finally, uh, as I said a second ago, we can use validate scripts to do just about anything you want to do. Um, again, it's anything you can stick in a script block. Oh, and sorry, I've got a helpful get computers command over here that just generates a list of computers. So nothing special there. But you can basically say, yeah, hey, I want this to test against the script. And if I, you know, it's a, it's a Boolean thing. Uh, if you have a result that ends up in with true, then it will succeed. Otherwise, it will throw an error. So, you know, we've got this example here where we can say, hey, I want to check if computer 20 exists. Sure, why not? Let's try for computer 21. Uh, that's going to fail. Uh, the message there, again, relatively rubbish. Um, it does give you the script block that's failing, but if a user is coming into that, then they are going to be thinking, what the heck is this about? Um, consequently, you can actually improve it. As we said, it just takes uh, the result of the, the check, and if it's Boolean true, then you're all good. So you could do something a little more complex, like having an if, not in throw, and then you can stick a nice error message there that will actually give a little bit of feedback for what you're looking for. Um, and if you get past that, then hey, you're all good. So similar to the last one, we can do that. And it's going to tell us that it's not found, which is mildly better. In terms of discovery, sorry, I'm trying to rush through this a little bit. Um, we've got a selection of things. Um, again, we, you know, so one of the things that I like to try and stick with is help, almost help-driven development, where you can write out an example um, and how you want the thing to be used before you get to actually writing how you're going to use it. Um, and this is nice because you can see what you think is going to happen um, and then basically write you know, everything that you've got there so that it's, uh, it matches. Um, and hey, it's much faster than test-driven development, at least. Um, so one of the nice things uh, you can do here is add help to parameters, which may or may not help users figure out what's going on. So if we've got here our example, uh, you know, there's, there's nothing there. Um, but you can, and you can see that there's no um, values for what that parameter is looking for. Uh, so you can actually add in help message, which is another attribute you can use to add some of that. So again, you know, here we can see 
we've got a mandatory parameter. It's actually going to prompt the user for help if they want it. So they can do that, and they can see, hey, that's that's the thing we chucked in there. And if you and if you then look at the help itself, then it's going to give you a little more detail. It'll give you the the help you've got there without actually worrying too much. Um, similarly, you've got stuff to show the default values. So if you've set something up, then you can have that available to users. Uh, and then fairly easily add in the same darn thing. Uh, worth noting that this one actually requires you to add in some comment-based help, which, is, which makes sense. If you've looked at the way get help works in other places. Um, so you can do other stuff with that. You can see here that we've got stuff like accepting pipeline input and wildcard characters, uh, stuff like the value from pipeline, value uh, by property from pipeline um, will allow you to set that. And of course, you can do stuff like um, supports wildcards to show that you support wildcards. The thing here is that it's not actually magic in any way, shape, or form. You've still got to actually figure out how to use that wildcard or implement the wildcard you're handling yourself. Uh, so as an example here, we've got kind of just a get filtered user. Again, we had uh, a couple of helper functions like get user here um, that we can use to show, hey, we are accepting wild characters here, and then we're just going to basically handle that. So we can see I've got too many users called Alice. I really shouldn't have generated that. Um, Right, running down into more exciting things. Sorry about that. Um, we've got argument completers, which are, you know, if you use them on a really basic level, you can essentially replicate validate set. Um, that's quite boring. We don't really want to do that. Um, happily, they're much more dynamic. These days, when you're using argument completers as attributes, you can use functions, you can generate stuff, and you can use kind of uh, script level or global, well, any kind of um, value you've got hanging around in the system. Um, so instead of doing something like this, uh, where, you know, if you, I forgot that I should be demonstrating that. Uh, you can kind of go between the various values, but that's no different to validate a set, as I said. So, you know, if you redefine that and you use something like get computers, then you can basically say, hey, any string that comes out of that is going to be an argument completer um, object, and you can see that, that it fails. Always good. Well, uh, it wouldn't be fun without that. Yes. Um, are you looking at enum directly against the argument computer? Um, I think you wouldn't use. Uh, I don't think you can. Uh, it accepts a script block. I don't believe you can. You you could iterate through the enum within the script block, but I don't think you can just pass it straight in. Um, Yes, absolutely. Um, so yeah, so going on from where we are failing horribly, um, <laughs> uh, I can skip directly ahead to that, or we can go through um, this one, which is basically using, uh, so argument completers uh, accept a couple of different parameters um, whenever you're running them. So you know, you've, as you can see here, I've defined, um, we've got command name, parameter name, word complete, command AST, and fake bound parameters. And these are great fun when you're trying to either filter based on uh, what the user has already added to the command line, or if you're trying to figure out what the heck you're actually testing for. Um, that becomes relevant later, because you can actually define an argument completer and then apply it to a bunch of different functions all at once. So if you've done that, um, you could write a very generic script block that, sorry, not a terribly generic script block, um, a script block you can apply to a bunch of places, and then you could test to see, hey, which, uh, which command am I running against, which parameter am I looking for? Um, so you could do something really awful, like a huge argument completer that works for anything. Probably shouldn't, um, but we'll get back to how to uh, do that in a second. In fact, just as a quick spoiler of a thing I suggest not doing, um, you could, for example, write a, a, an argument completer for resource group name and apply it to everything that has the parameter resource group name. It's probably a really terrible idea. Don't do it. Um, 
but nipping back to the argument for police parameters. Um, so the, the, I think the most uh, easy access one of these is word complete. Um, when you're uh, in an argument completer, you can use this to basically, to, to use it to filter the results that you're getting from the argument completion uh, and use that to spit out the right results. So if we had a bunch of users, <laughs> and I'm gonna remember that I've got three Alice's here, because that seems like a great use of this. Um, then there we go, yeah, we should be able to set use computer uh, and then filter by Alice, or oh, sorry. <laughs> wow, that did not work at all. Um, that would be right. So we should be able to filter by Alice and A and get Alice. Um, so you know you can you can write this uh, to use horrible th well fun things like regex, um, basic things like this. So using uh, wildcard support uh, and using like uh, to do uh, more easy access stuff, um, and and you can write this however you want. And diving further into what Evan said, um, you can actually use completion results, um, which allow you to do more useful things like. Uh, showing, sorry, so one of the things you can do when you're completing is use stuff like tab completion to just literally page through results, which is slightly lazy, but again, shows users what you're looking for. Um, and if you use control space or something along these lines, you can go and select from all the results that are currently available, depending on what you filtered down to, depending on what you're um, allowing the user to look at. If you use the completion result object, um, you can actually change stuff like the tooltip that you're showing out. So if you have a fairly non-readable property like a GUID, um, you can use this to show users what you're actually talking about. So again, if we look at, say, user computer, um, we can try paging through stuff. Horrible GUIDs, love it. Um, but you can see that the tooltip at the bottom uh, is showing a human readable result. So great for users being able to discover what you're looking to pass. Um, Does the argument considered run every time they get tabbed? Yeah, it reruns. You can um, really play around with outputting to outputting using uh, verbose or host, I think, um, in order to, you know, get, getting into debugging it is quite fun, um, but it gets really messy if you've got some. Oh, I'm sorry, yes. Um, so the question was, uh, can does it run every time you hit tab? Um, and the answer is yes. Uh, so you know, you, when, you, when you're debugging, if you've got some code in there that shows, uh, you know, at outputs all the results, uh, your command line is gonna get messy really fast. Um, so as I said a second ago, um, we can also define this stuff as a script block and then apply it to just about anything. Um, well, we can apply it to two parameters on other commands. Uh, we probably shouldn't do it like this, but we could certainly, for example, do something as, with uh, a little less scope, like taking all the commands that you have in your module and applying known stuff to that. Uh, and of course, the thing to bear in mind is before you go off and write horribly lengthy things to do argument completion is that often you'll find that somebody's already solved it for you. So if you look around at uh, compiled modules or other, uh, such things, you can often find interesting, fun examples of resource, uh, sorry, of argument completers that have been uh, completed already. Uh, so there's a couple of examples here from Azure where it will allow you to pass in uh, various things. At, oh, sorry. The other thing that I was going to cover, sorry. <laughs> Doing well. We covered command name, parameter name, and word complete. Uh, command AST in this case is, you, you can use that to essentially look at what you're running around the function you're currently in. Um, and so you can do, again, interesting things if you wanted to write a fairly generic argument completer and then um, use that for anything. Fake bound parameters is uh, excellent um, because it allows you to use uh, results that are currently being passed into other parameters on your line. So what you could do there is if you have, for example, had uh, to use Azure as, as an example again, um, you could use a uh, resource group name to further filter down what you're trying to do. If you had computer name and, and a resource group name, you could filter for computers within that resource group based on fake bound parameters. Uh, and that'll result in an object that looks a lot like uh, PS bound parameters, as it happens. So all of those parameters, 
sorry. <laughs> so, um, as was, was asked or said, um, all those, all those uh, parameters that are currently being uh, typed out on the command line, if you have argument complete on your function, when you hit tab, they're all passed into that script block. Uh, so they're all available for you and you can use them however you want. Um, right, so sorry, I've now completely knocked myself out of order. Um, <laughs> let's figure out where we are. Um, so then, um, yeah, and the, yeah, there's, uh, this is the one call that's gonna go horribly wrong because I'm not connected to Wi-Fi, so I'm not actually gonna run it. But yeah, there are available things um, such as uh, the Azure resource group completer uh, and resource name completer, which already have excellent caching built in, uh, so they're much faster than you might see otherwise. Um, the one trick there is that if you're gonna use them, you have to add a couple of namespaces. Um, so you know, Microsoft Azure's commands, resource manager, common argument completers. But if you go searching for this sort of thing, there's often uh, nice resources in place already um, that you can use. Uh, that's one of my favorite examples, I think. Right, uh, so on to transformation. Um, one of the fun things, oh, I'm glad I've got Paul here now, actually. Sorry. Um, one of the things you've got uh, here is you can actually write, obviously you can write uh, most of these attributes yourself, um, either as a PowerShell class or in C Sharp. Um, if you want to write a transformation um, class, you need to essentially have uh, uh, an inherited, you write a class that has the inherited argument transformation attribute uh, parent class. Um, and that's gotta have your, your transform uh, method. Updating my comments as we go, sorry. Um, and th this can be fairly simple. You know, this, this is a really short um, class I've got here. It's, it's literally just implementing this one method. Um, and all that's doing is basically, so you, you've got your engine entering and your input data, um, and it, you can play with the input data however you want. Um, obviously, you can do, PowerShell is a fiend for casting between different types. Um, and I think I mean that in a good way. Um, makes it very easy for us uh, when we're working with stuff to be able to um, reliably say, hey, this, this will probably work. You know, enums can become uh, ints. You can really mess around with booleans and ints as well. Um, I think I saw a great example in the code golf by Kevin Lockett, um, where you, you know, it, was, it was the old version of um, uh, null coalescing. Um, and uh, so there's lots of stuff you can play with there. But if you want to write something much more specific, um, so that you can either cast between different data types, then you can write a transform, um, an argument transformation thing. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, so yeah, so as simple as that, we can basically say, hey, if, if uh, for example, we wanted to, again, working with GUIDs and, uh, and non-readable GUIDs and user IDs, if we wanted to have, say, a function that allowed you to specify a user, uh, either as an ID or as a username, uh, assuming that you have unique usernames, of course, um, then you could write something along these lines where you test to see, hey, is this a GUID? You, know, you could test that it's a valid GUID as well if you wanted. Um, and if it is, then hey, we've got our GUID. No worries, let's return that. Um, else, if this is a string, or looks like a string, because of course everything can become a string, um, then let's go look at our users and we'll return the user ID for the user that we think we've got. Um, we can apply that to a parameter and say, hey, um, user ID transform on, on our user. Uh, and we should be able to see, if we're lucky, if I'm lucky, uh, that we've got a bunch of users, most of which are called Alice. Eh, not so bad. And then we could try updating our user. Uh, and I'm gonna try just quickly using Rita's user here. Sorry. So once again, we're gonna use that good, because that looks like a good, brilliant. Um, but if we wanted to, we could similarly do update user Walter. Why not do this? Uh, we can see that hopefully matches AF7, our Walter good here. Um, so yeah, so you can, you can add, do this sort of thing really easily. Um, and not only can you do kind of simple transforms where you have data that you want to change. You know, you, you could have something where you're, you're, you're changing your types or multiplying things in a known way. Um, you can even use it to completely 
um, abuse the idea uh, and go and return something that is unrelated but useful. Uh, so in this example, uh, we've got a lovely package parameter attribute. Um, very poor. It's a fun one, honest. Um, where we can say, hey, um, you know, with because because it's a class, you can apply anything else you want. So you you know you can make static methods, you can add static methods, you can add constructors uh, in order to add the properties that we had earlier, um, and you could use those to go off and look up other data. You, it's again, you know, it's it's like the argument completers, but as as powerful. Um, sorry. So what I mean by that is. You can use uh, your argument completion to completely modify the data that you're passing back, um, even even further than going between the user ID and GUID that we had as an example a second ago. Uh, in this case, you know, if you had a selection of parameters that you were otherwise using elsewhere, you could go and look that up based on the attributes that you've added. So you could have something like this and apply uh, this parameter. So we've got in this case a constructor that uses a target, uh, and you can go and look up that target and return that data because it's it's not you know the, you're not worried about having that data however you want. You're not worried about having that data uh, actually relate to the thing you're passing in. Um, but you probably shouldn't. That's the note I've added there. Um, and similarly, sorry, um, you can write all this, oh god, I'm way off time. Um, so yeah, you can also do this in C Sharp, um, which is handy because uh, classes obviously were only introduced relatively recently. Um, so you can actually write that out in, in, uh, in with add type and have that work nicely. And that can go back uh, even further if you use it as, um, as a compiled module, because you can ship that with everything going back to two, I think. Sorry. Um, coming towards time, are there any questions on any of the stuff that I haven't babbled about already. Okay. Um, so. I think there are. Um, I can't remember what the numbers would be like, I'm afraid. Sorry. But yes, I believe there are. Um, OK. Uh, sorry. Um, I, yeah, we, we could walk into doing this in C Sharp, but I feel like other people will do this much better than me. So I am going <laughs> to tap out at that point. Um, so any further questions right now? I'm sorry, uh, the question was, can you do an, an, an argument completer on a validation set? Yes. yes, absolutely, you can apply, sorry, uh, one of the things I should have said earlier was that you can apply basically all of these at once. Uh, obviously, you'll probably get some horrible mismatch in uh, validation if you try that, um, but yes, you can, sorry, uh, to apply everything at once. Oh, no, sorry, um, am I saying it's not a good idea to apply an argument completer and also a validate set or similar yeah. at the same time? I'd say that's not a bad idea. Um, that's fine. I, I meant, sorry, more um, if you applied, for example, uh, validate length and a uh, validate pattern, that would be yeah. less good. Uh, so um, the statement was uh, you have a, a validate set that has about seven or eight objects, yeah. uh, and it would be useful for users to be able to see that. Yeah. Uh, the validate set should actually add um, that completion, I believe. Oh, right. Whereas, yes, sorry. So you'd have a, a long list at the top of the file. Uh, whereas if you had an argument completer with something that implemented uh, a lookup in it, it would at least be a little more manageable. Uh, right, uh, if you actually want to talk to me after this, um, come find me in the halls or online. Um, my site, justpowerdown.com, uh, links out to a lot of this stuff. I'm JP Ruskin in a lot of places. I am ja.mesrusk.in on Blue Sky, which is very memorable. Uh, and I'm JP Ruskin at mass.to on Mastodon. Um, finally, have a great day. Um, one last thanks to the organizers from me, and I hope to see some of you at the event this evening.